All right, friends, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for spending um, a little bit of your Tuesday uh, evening uh, with us. Um, we're uh, in Central Time coming to you from Kansas City, where we had snow today on April 20th. Uh, but what a great day. Uh, time to, to reflect on the foray requiem. Just a couple housekeeping things. Um, make sure to keep yourself muted uh, during uh, the lecture. And if you have questions, uh, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat um, and we will try to uh, answer them as we go. I forgot to mention, my name is Ben Spaulding and I am the founder and artistic director of the Spire Chamber Ensemble and Baroque Orchestra. And again, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. We're going to be looking at the Foray Requiem. And if you registered for Eventbrite, um, you will you were sent a, a link to the handout. Also, the handout is in the chat if you would like to download that. Uh, we are going to be focusing on the uh, John Rutter um, original chamber version um, this evening. So if you don't have that score, there is a link at the uh, top of the handout to a somewhat similar uh, score that's public domain that you can reference uh, to. So let's go ahead and get started. As I just mentioned, tonight we're going to spend time uh, with the John Rutter version, uh, this original chamber version that was really written for a liturgical purpose. So in the handout, I put some background information that you can read on your own, um, just so uh, everybody knows what I'm going to be referencing. Um, in the middle of the handout, I'll talk about the um, instrumentation that um, I use. Um, and so there's, there's some things in this chamber ensemble version that are not essential. Um, they don't play all that often, um, and I typically choose uh, to perform uh, without these instruments. And so uh, the essential instruments, um, you need at least two horns. You need harp, you need organ, and you need strings, including one solo violin. Um, you also need violas and cellos. Um, now you have to have a minimum of uh, three first um, violas and two second violas, um, and then you need two and two of the cellos. Now, you can use just one uh, double bass, contra bass. Um, there is some Divisi, um, so I, I tend to, if I'm contracting, to use uh, two for that to give a rich uh, foundation uh, and a dark muted color. This version that we're going to be spending uh, about the next 90 minutes with really is essentially an organ accompaniment amplified and colored by other instruments. I want you to remember that because that's a really uh, important aspect. Um, however, one of the temptations with this piece is that the organ is kind of an afterthought. Um, sometimes um, to, to make things blend and to make things all, all fit well, the poor organist has to sacrifice um, color and tonality. But really remember, Ferre conceived this piece also being a brilliant organist. Um, so the colors, the life of the organ um, is very important. We wanna hear um, his exquisite writing. And so there's, there's moments that are called parte, but your organist will be very happy if they can play all of this as an organ, bringing the unique elements of the organ to the piece. One of the uh, other tricky things um, as we uh, are looking at uh, performing this piece is we are using organ. Um, and in my experience now having done uh, the piece maybe about nine or 10 times um, is that uh, remember organs cannot change pitch. Um, they, are, they are fixed. Hopefully our instruments are maintained well um, and tuned and, and air pressure is regulated, all those things that go into what Mozart called the king of instruments. However, in my experience, um, it, this typically happens in various churches, even with great programs, the organ tends to sit a little low around uh, 438 or 439. Um, and that can create some intonation issues um, because modern players, um, especially today, are tuning higher and higher. I don't know if you knew this, but the LA Phil uh, tunes to A442. That's they're one of the highest in the United States. And so imagine if you have an organ that's uh, 338 
Um, and uh, the strings and the winds are accustomed to playing high and bright to make the sound project. You know, four senses uh, doesn't sound like that much, but over the course of this piece, that can make um, a difference. And so one solution to that I like to um, offer to you tonight is that at the beginning of our 2D rehearsal um, with the um, organ is we just simply say, we get out our phone and we find what pitch um, one of the principal um, uh, stops of the organ is. Um, hopefully it's consistent and we find whatever that is and we just let the orchestra know this is, this is where the organ is. Um, and then the other thing that I've tried before, and, I, and it sounds really simple, um, but I borrowed this idea from the great string quartets of the world. You know, they often start each um, of their rehearsals with playing um, a scale or a unison passage or some arpeggios of the key or, or key moments or cadences of the work coming up. And I've watched great string quartets do this. Um, and it's, it's, it's fascinating and intriguing how quickly um, just a moment, maybe a minute or less of that can really get everybody on the same page um, and, and get our, our ears to really focus on the tuning, especially if there's a discrepancy uh, of where the organ is at. So hopefully that's a little bit of a helpful uh, practice to you. This lecture is entitled A Compendium of Ideas. Um, performance possibilities. Um, and so you may be asking, why would we spend time with this? Well, I think Foray himself um, gives us um, some uh, a wonderful quote that helps us really dive into this piece. He says this, it has been said that my requiem does not express the fear of death and someone has called it a lullaby of death. But it is thus that I see death as a happy deliverance, an aspiration towards happiness above rather than a painful experience. We are gifted with this piece, um, this version 128 years later. It is one of the softest and slowest requiem settings um, in the choral literature. If we use Foray's tempos, that only ranges from 40 to 72 beats per minute. That is in the slow range. But what he does within that range is just exquisite. So discovering the composer's intentions, um, coupled with highlighting subtleties of expression and nuance are worth our time. And we're gonna do that now. We start with the introit at Kyrie. Um, I give a link um, in the handout um, a Google Doc link uh, to my Viola One part that I've used now many times um, in, in, in versions with professional choirs and church choirs and uh, large community choirs. Um, so hopefully that is helpful to you. You can look at some of the things that I mark and what the, uh, the principal violas have marked um, over a few performances. Conductors, as we start this piece, um, it, it looks relatively easy to start, but I want to caution us that um, Foray marks a quarter equals 40. So that may seem very, very slow, and, and it, it is quite slow. Um, the one thing that I have learned um, from, from a countless players, I, I would venture to say hundreds and hundreds that I've talked to um, over the years, is they always want information. They want to play um, their very best from the moment. And so whatever we can do to dispel confusion always helps them. And so I like to personally give um, a light seven, eight prep, or if you're thinking an eight, four and, and then conduct in a big four. Again, we want to help them play better. So if we can dispel any confusion, and I can't tell you how many times orchestra members have come up and said, thank you for that double prep. Thank you for a little bit more information that we can just be really confident with exactly what you want. It's important in this first note that um, I am prepping and I'm, I'm thinking about the articulation of the horns. In this case, I'm, I'm using two. And so what does their color emulate? What is their articulation? What is the articulation I'm going for? And I want to prep them. They are, to, in, in my ear, is the most important thing along with um, the organ. 
Speaking about organs again, remember that you, we can't ask an organist to play a note more accented. This, if we're just banging on the keys, that does nothing to an organist. And a lot of people um, don't necessarily realize that, uh, perhaps coming from a piano background. Um, so we need to ask the organist for uh, various different stops, uh, principles or reads if we need more sound, but they can only change the, the length of the note. They can't play it softer or louder. It doesn't matter if it's a tracker or electro um, the, it No matter what you, you do to the key, unlike a piano, is um, so if we can conductors, if we can avoid um, asking them to just play um, more accented or heavier, that's, that's not gonna do the trick. Um, so the strings are gonna need our attention right after that um, to encourage the bow to be really consistent um, as we go. The fourth bar, this is something that I think has really developed in me um, with all my work with Baroque music. And so I like to assign affect words or emotional words to orchestral um, ideas. So you look at the very first um, three bars, there's no movement until the end of the third bar. So for me, I assign that an affect word. I'm thinking in my head, deep sleep. And sometimes I'll write that in the score. I, I might say that to an orchestra if I've worked with them a lot, just to to create an image, um, it's very easy just to go ba ba, and that's totally fine. But if you think of the word deep sleep or sleep well, there's a little bit of difference in that, right? The clearer the picture is in our head of what we want things to sound like, the clearer it will be for the orchestra. The, the strings can decrescendo um, as uh, we, we come into this uh, section um, at the soft moments. Um, they can play closer to the bridge. I also give some descriptive words um, that uh, help um, uh, translate into a very diffused and translucent, even airy sound. We go through the introduction in the orchestra. Uh, several things are happening. You can uh, you can see that with the extreme dynamics at measure eleven. This for me is the climax of the piece into measure twelve. Again, I assign affect words um, to the last couple uh, the last notes of twelve. And so for me, it's let light shine. Again, for me, that creates an image um, of how I want the strings, uh, the weight of the bow, of um, how they can um, really make this, this, this music have deep affect. Um, so consider that um, as possibilities. There are no right or wrong answers. Um, the words that you make up, usually these are words that are just you, um, but I think that that helps us. And we decrescendo all the way through this playing um, measure 15 into a triple P. I like to change that. Um, and then we have these horn entrances at 15, just normal half notes. But again, I like to, at least in my mind, make those really special. There's a way, there's a reason for a punctuated um, this last few bars. My wife and I were on a trip to the Smoky Mountains recently. And I remember walking through the forest and um, it, was, it was very covered and you could hardly see any light. But every once in a while, these light rays would seep through the trees. Um, and so that's the image that I think of um, in these horn entrances, that just a little bit of like a little messa de voce and that's less each time. Now, several things that the choir can do throughout this. Um, introduction, um, a possibility of creating a very diffused, a very um, ghostly, uh, even as tiny bit airy sound. We can also um, work to create a focus, bright, intimate sound. Um, I learned this from uh, one of my mentors is a, one of the best ways uh, to uh, sing soft is to make the sound more finite and more focused. And so I will do, um, usually with amateur choirs, some kind of motion that focuses our sound. We're drawing it from the mask and we're, we're, we're the softer we sing, the more finite and focused the sound gets. 
So we have an amazing soprano colleague that I've worked with for many years, uh, Sarah Moyer, and she's going to sing a little bit of the beginning of um, the choral parts, um, these two different styles. Let's watch Sarah demonstrate the differences. And what are you thinking when you're doing that? Or what are, what's going through your mind? Um, I'm really, um, an idea of mine is trying to make it sound as dark as possible without um, without completely uh, compensating my, um, my technique. Um, and to also make it as airy as possible without making the girl a little too crazy, <laughs> which I think is, is totally an acceptable thing. I'm, I'm never, I'm, I'm never offended when someone asks me to sing airy if it's for a specific affect and if it's not for a very long amount of time. Um, I, I think that that is totally okay. <laughs> I think you make a great point that sustained um, things like that can be very difficult, and especially for an entire mass um, like, like this. Um, now, can you try a version where um, we're, the sound isn't as diffused, um, but we're, we're really focusing the sound in a very finite, the softer we sing, the, the, the clearer and the more pointed the sound becomes. What, can you try a version of that for us? Can you do that one more time? It cut out just for a second. Sure. Great. And in this version, what are you thinking? In this version, I'm really trying to keep my sound as pointed as possible um, within, um, that is kind of lower in my range specifically. So it is actually harder to sing soft, low, and with point. Um, so that is uh, the that is probably the softest that I personally can sing. And that's, and that's okay too. Yeah. Right. Like um, your your neighbor is going to be able to do something different than you. And so I think it's great to play off your neighbor's strengths in a situation like this. And if you have a warmer voice to your right, who can really core it up and make it a beautiful, you know, soft sound, that's awesome. Uh, so I, I like to depend on my neighbors for situations like this. Great. Okay, as we keep moving um, through the core parts, the other thing that you can do um, that with a, a large chorus um, is at the beginning of this uh, section is to um, add a low D. Now, I know Ferre did not write a low D um, at the beginning of this. However, um, uh, a few times with large choruses, if I have a few low basses that have just a, a sizzling low D or something like a strobas, almost kind of a vocal fry down there, that can create just this beautiful otherworldly color. Um, I once did that with a very large chorus where I put the um, those few basses and their sound just permeated throughout um, the this section. So just adding that fundamental, that low D, um, nobody in the audience um, will be able to hear it probably, but that adds a wonderful effect. So I put some other things that you can think about, um, possibilities um, in uh, the handout. We're going to move uh, now uh, through the A section. Um, and again, I like to prep um, with a light 3-4, always giving the orchestra as much information to be successful as possible. Um, remember that um, letter A, one solution I might do is to um, acknowledge um, the cellos and basses. Remember, they control the tempo of the orchestra. Um, and then I will perhaps shape um, the uh, violas and um, cello um, on the line on the Mesa de Voce. Um, so we also, this is where the cello comes in. Um, we've had it played before, but they, they are in this wonderful melody. And so my colleague, uh, Sasha Groeshing, um, recorded some thoughts about playing uh, the, the wonderful, beautiful lines um, in this music. Let's watch her describe the um, idiosyncrasies of the cello at this moment.
great. That was so beautiful. So um, when we're looking at bar 23 through 25, we really want that to be just extremely uh, molto expressivo up to the top line. Um, if our cellos are strong, our apologies, having a little bit of technical difficulties. I think after 13, 14 months of this, we've all gotten used to, uh, sometimes it just doesn't work quite uh, like it's supposed to. We'll give it just a moment, and if it doesn't work, well, there we go. Um, but when I'm coming back down, I kind of have to choose my battles, because it's a really, what I would make sure that they are comfortable with is really having a fingering that works. And um, I think, especially coming down from the high note, you want to make sure that your hand is really balanced. Um, so if you're tilting your hand a little bit, that can cause intonation craziness. Um, but when I'm coming back down, I kind of have to choose my battles because it's a really awkward shift. It's an awkward set of notes. So what I want to do is I can either choose to come down on my A string, which is what I just did in the example, or I can kind of choose my battles and, and choose to do some of it on the D string. And one way it kind of keeps the timbre the same way, if you stay on the same string, it, it really solidifies the sound, but I have to shift a lot more. Um, so the other way might be a little bit smoother, but you might hear the, the change in the sound. So you kind of have to choose which one you like better. Wonderful. So some thoughts there uh, to consider. The, the line, the tenor line, um, can, uh, there's a couple different ways that we can perform it. So, so sometimes you'll hear versions of this um, where it's very kind of disembodied, um, very ethereal. Um, though for me, I like to have a really pleading quality to it. So a little bit more tone, um, a little bit more brilliance to it um, as we go. There's a couple other things that I write. Um, that we go through this section. Letter B, we have the tenors again, similar idea, but um, Ferre does some differences, and so we need to consider why he does those differences and how um, we should highlight them. Measure 38 is such an amazing arrival um, moment, and then we get um, into uh, the few bars before letter C. Uh, and this one often happens, uh, again, really treating the organ as an organ. And so two bars before C, I want to be able to hear a beautiful color and maybe just not one puny stop. Um, so often um, it, it sounds a little weird. You have one just uh, flute stop or something. Um, and then even the cellos, four cellos, five cellos, six cellos playing soft. There's, there's a disjoint there. And so we want to match colors there. We want to allow the organist um, to again play um, their strengths and their colors. Letter C is one of the most important things of the Requiem. This is this Tedechet, to you we vow hymns uh, to God in Zion. Um, and so uh, we, we, we have um, Sarah, again, is going to talk about singing uh, this phrase. Um, and this is an important phrase because this is the only um, thematic material that Frey uses um, throughout the Requiem um, and develops it. So let's watch Sarah a bit. And I tried to is definitely, I mean, I'm, this is very common knowledge, right? We are always wanting to go to the apex of the phrase and then come back down. This is, you know, a four bar plus a four bar, 
not, it doesn't, it's not really like, it's kind of like a four bar, a little bit of a lift and then a four bar. We don't want to just make it four bars, four bars. Um, so one of the things I want to think about before I start singing is breathing for the apex of the phrase. We always think about it, but why don't we prepare ourselves physically for it? Um, so I love the, um, the concept of the surprise inhalation, um, it's, you know, it's commonly referred to as like the aha or, or a yawn or a sigh. Um, it's where you just inhale quickly and you feel that soft palate rise pretty high. Um, and we want to just keep that pretty much lifted. And when we inhale, we're going to basically inhale for that higher E flat. As a soprano, I need to prepare myself for anything that's higher than the note that I start with. And so I'm going to inhale for that E flat. So instead of, instead of if I want to practice this, for instance, I'm going to... I'm going to figure out what I need, what height I need for that E flat first, and then I'll incorporate it into the earlier into the phrase. So uh, the, the word is hemos, hemos, and understanding that sensation is just really important to me. And so when I incorporate that into the rest of the phrase, I'm breathing for that. Instead, I'm starting. I think that's one of the first things is understanding that phrase and and really, I mean, one of the cool things about Foray, right, is that like he totally writes for the voice. He doesn't. He won't ever write you a phrase that's too long. Like you can always breathe. It doesn't make you like die as if you're like running out of breath. So I think that that's one of the coolest things about him that you, you, he's pretty, um, you can always like expect when, you know, you're going to be able to breathe. So there's no surprises there. Um, and then I think also in the in the last um, two bars of that, so uh, in the rudder version, we're looking at bars measures uh, 18 and 19. It kind of we we want to make that um, you know we don't want to like give up so fast. Uh, I think a tendency might to be to sing it. But I think, in my opinion, I would rather it kind of pick up a little more when we sing in Jerusalem. So, and also making sure that we continue singing that last D like super beautifully because I know it's easy to just kind of give up on it. Um, but it, it is a note that lasts for three full beats and it needs to in that beautiful line. So. Oh, I Great. So um, as we get into letter D, um, the strings really set up so much of the drama. We're going to check back in uh, with Sasha on cello, um, and she's going to play um, a little bit um, into this section uh, into D. So let's take um, a brief look now. Great. So Sasha, we're, the next example we're going to play is letter C. Um, and you'll notice that uh, Foray slurs it um, in whole bar units, um, and then uh, uh, four bars into that, he changes it into groups of two. Can you play the example maybe of about five or six bars at C with doing Foray's markings um, where he changes? Okay, here I go. <laughs> If we choose to slur it all together, what would that in, in full bars, what would that sound like? example is going to be right before letter D. We have this really active 
uh, part that leads into the text exaudi. Um, can you do it, um, the bar before D, um, where it's a not hooked bowing? Okay. Just where we left off, here's not, not hooked. <laughs> That's great. In the same figure, um, over and over for all. Can we try a hooked bowing? Now, um, would you try your version for me? Um, so not hooked, um, but can we really separate the um, uh, the dot of the quarter note? Da, ah, 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 ah. What does that sound like? So that gives us some possibilities there. Um, we move on through uh, letter D, um, several things that I, I write there. The one big thing I wanna point out um, before we move on um, to the end of this movement is measure 54. Um, I often uh, hear this as where um, we start to decrescendo too early. Um, for me, just looking at what Foray marks, uh, th this is sempre forte that we resist the urge to decrescendo. To you all flesh must come our translation. So really broad full tone all the way um, into um, starting the, the cascade down at 58. Now letter E, um, we have something in interesting here, um, similar um, to the tenor line, um, though he marks it dolce, and we don't have any hairpins, any crescendo marks. And so one way we can interpret that is, you know, most of us learn that music is either coming or going, or we're gathering energy, or we're releasing energy. But there is a middle ground option. And for me, that is perfectly still. And so this might be a time where uh, we could choose that option. We get in through um, another active section with Christe. Christe Eleison, I'll give you several uh, performance things there. Um, we're gonna jump to the very end of this movement, measure 83. We have this single horn line. And again, I think this is very important, just a couple of notes, but it really sets the tone for me is as somebody was, was visiting the scene of this funeral scene um, and, and they, their message calls the soul to reckoning. Their message is so important that it has to be heard. And so I like to make um, a lot out of that horn part and those couple measures um, as, as we go. Okay, we got to move on. Uh, just there's lots more that you can read um, on your own into um, this movement. The offertory. As we're starting this one, um, uh, now having done this piece uh, several times and, and seeing lots of great conductors do it, uh, there may be this urge to start this in eight. Um, and I've played around with several options uh, over the years. Um, and for me, um, because of, of the quarter equals 48, that um, eight uh, starts to slow down. Um, and what really solidifies that for me, if I'm, if I'm in eight and I get to bar five, that for me feels awkward. I really feel like the harmony moves in bigger pulses. And so I'd like to start that um, either with a two, three, bum, bum, or you could do one, two, three. Uh, I've also seen people start it in eight and move to four that I don't like that option as much, but definitely consider a big four, um, always thinking um, the subdivision. So we're gonna check back in with Sasha. Um, she's going to demonstrate um, how we would play uh, this line because it is emulating the vocal text that comes up. Let's check in with Sasha. So we're uh, again at the uh, offertory movement. Um, and Sasha, can you play, um, you're gonna play the cello two line um, and then you're going to move to cello one, um, uh, a bar into it. Um, but we're trying to emulate the vocal line here. So what, what does that sound like? Okay, so 
So I'm going to separate the first note just a teeny bit, but barely. It's like almost imperceivable. Imperceivable. Is that a word? That's a word. Okay. <laughs> we have some uh if we had some more um players that don't have as much experience at letter uh letter four at rehearsal four what that's that's we're getting into a higher register there what are some things that you're thinking about as you play this higher passage and then you have to come down quite quickly what are some technical things that you would suggest to make that work um well i want to make sure that i mean we're in foray so we can use a little bit of our shifts as expressive material um, but I don't want it to be like grotesque. So, you know, a lot of earlier music, like Baroque music, we want to hide our shifts and pretend like we never have to move. Um, but when we're getting into layer music, we get to use our shifts as beautiful stuff. So I probably, I, I want that shift to, I probably want to hear a teeny bit of it, but not, I don't want it to be, again, gross. So you hear a little bit of it. Um, we want to connect those two notes. It's really hard because it's a giant, sh you know, giant jump. Um, but we don't want it to sound like. Yeah, that's great. Very helpful. Thank you. Okay, and so we move through the orchestral introduction into uh, the alto and tenor parts. Um, for me, I think this is one of the hardest movements. It's also the longest. Um, so we need to be uh, very detailed with how we're working um, with the choir uh, throughout these two voice uh, fugues and all of the nuances. There's, there's many, many things that I've written um, that you uh, can consider. Um, my biggest advice is to save time for this movement um, as, as we go. There's so many nuances um, throughout this. Um, we're going to jump uh, to the uh, baritone entrance. This is um, right before letter D. And a couple of just practical things to, to be aware of is uh, I personally like to take it off the baritone. Um, so they haul and I catch them on the eighth. Um, though that can be dangerous because this is a long line coming up. And so you may need to lead there um, as, as well. Um, I've worked with many baritones and the, the tendency is to want to slow down a little bit um, in, in this section. Again, coming from that, that, that chant affect. And so really encourage them uh, to, to keep it moving um, as we go. Several uh, beautiful moments in this letter F, skipping there to a little bit, we have the uh, Tedechet theme that is as quoted, um, this idea of Jerusalem. Um, so we're gonna check back in with Sasha um, around letter F and she's gonna play just a little bit of that. That's an important moment. Again, that connective tissue that Foray uses in developing um, uh, uh, a theme throughout the Requiem. Uh, so one bar after F. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we just want that just so dolce and so expressivo, um, but piano, can you play that for us? Mm -hmm. Here I go. <laughs> Can, can the highest note of the phrase be the lightest? Can we taper to that? Um, so we're, we're leading towards the second bar. Okay. 
Exactly. Yeah. We get into letter G um, in, uh, with all the vocal parts um, in uh, this, uh, with these entrances. Um, measure 90, we need to jump to the end. Um, I often think this is one of the most difficult parts um, of the Requiem. Uh, because it's very exposed, the orchestra drops out. We just have uh, the the choir accompanied uh, by organ. Um, the parts are high; they're exposed um, after a long movement. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into making this um, difficult. Um, just another thing that I think that um, not a lot of people know from I, I learned this from the uh, American Acoustical Society is that they did a, a massive study uh, where they, they ask musicians, uh, orchestral musician, musicians throughout the great symphonies of our country, um, how do you perceive pitch that comes from an organ? Um, and many people said that when we hear only flute stops, stops that are emulating a flute down, we hear those flat. And part of that is because of the decay of the way uh, that the pipe speaks. And so in moments like this, I try to avoid everything I can to have just pure flute stops um, because the, there is a, there's a good chance that, that they will be perfectly in tune, but be, be some of the acoustical principles of the decay will make us um, feel like they're slightly flat and then we're, and then we're sunk there. Um, so principles or strings there are very helpful. Um, so spend a lot of time um, in this this last uh, several bars to just get it nuanced um, and beautiful. And I give some suggestions there. Okay, moving on to the Sanctus movement. So many uh, wonderful things going on here. Again, I'd like to encourage us, a, a slight double prep is very helpful just to solidify uh, the beginning of this. We, we want the harp to play so seamlessly. This is the first time they enter um, in the Requiem, and so uh, we want to be able to um, let them really have their moment. Now, there's a lot of elements going on here that I just want to draw your attention to quickly. Um, so we have this first inversion harmony of E-flat, these overlapping phrases, and this atmosphere of ambiguity um, with a perplexing sense of meter. It, it might even create a dreamlike haze. Well, what compositional devices is Foray doing to make this happen? A couple things. We have subdivisions of the violas in groups of two. So that might feel like more like a two, four. Um, and then we have the uh, first descending while the uh, second viola is ascending in this contrary motion. So again, that's confusing. Um, the organ is not holding um, a, an, an E flat major in root position chord. Um, we're um, in first inversion, um, the harp line, it's written in a natural way where there's uh, less accents on big beats. Also notice the sopranos are singing in, in a hemiola uh, type style in a three, two, especially when you go song, twos, we allied those S's. We're in a three, two, what is going on here? So all of these things combined together create this instability, this, this feeling of the remoteness of heaven. So we're going to uh, watch my uh, wonderful colleague, um, Varun Eek, um, that is an amazing violinist. We're gonna first focus on the uh, violin part uh, for a little bit, and then we'll talk about singing this piece. This is the first time the violin enters um, and it's so exquisite, but there's a lot of nuance that goes into it. Let's learn more about this part from Veronique. Difficult to approach. So the, the first thing for me is the key. Uh, e flat major is not a key that is used a whole lot for violin music. Um, I couldn't say why exactly composers are, are, are not choosing that key so often, but uh, in terms of of learning something in E flat major, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that since you open E and you open A are now E flat and A flat. 
Apologies again. Great, so we have my wonderful colleague Veronique with us, an amazing violin player, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Song Tus movement. And this is the first time um, where the solo violin um, comes in. So Veronique, what makes this uh, challenging from a violinist perspective? Well, that's a great question because it is a, it is a challenging excerpt and I can think of a few different things that make it uh, difficult to approach. So the, the first thing for me is the key. Uh, e flat major is not a key that is used a whole lot for violin music. Um, I couldn't say why exactly composers are, are, are not choosing that key so often, but uh, in terms of, of learning something in E flat major, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that since you open E and you open A are now E flat and A flat, you really lose a lot of the natural resonance that you would get from your upper open strings, which often helps with tuning because then you hear well your perfect fifth or you'll hear notes um, vibrate a little bit more when they're against um, an open string that's, that would be played at the octave or something like that. So the, the key is definitely challenging. Um, so it's not a key that we play a lot in, unfortunately. Um, if you know a little bit about the violin, like you might know something about the position, like anything past third position is a little bit less secure for violinists because uh, we start to be um, higher than the side of the violin, which we just have a little bit less, um, I don't want to say less confidence playing there, but there's less, it's less of a secure position. Like we, well, in general, first, third positions are the most common one. And then going to fifth position and fourth position is really in between. Um, so having the first notes start in fourth position on a B flat and E flat major are all things that really contribute to, to making uh, the solo, I would say a little bit dangerous for intonation. And um, I think it's probably not always performed with a mute, but it is written uh, muted, right? So even in terms of the, the resonance that you might hear uh, close to your ears. So if I'm playing without the mute, the opening, there's a little bit of ring, right? And then you put the mute on and then so you already lose so much of the sound quality in a way, right? So there's the, there are a lot of things that work against the violin there. Um, and then of course the pianissimo dynamic marking will really um, make people think of being very careful with the first note. So you have all these elements that um, are not really helping the violinist go with a confident approach, I would say. And then on top of that, you have to match your intonation to the voice. And I know for myself, every time I'm playing um, with a vocalist, whether it's with a choir, with a, with a solo voice, I lose a lot of confidence in my own pitch because I right away want to adjust. And sometimes the vibrato of a singer or a group of singer fluctuates a little bit more than the vibrato of, of a violin, right? So then I feel like I'm constantly trying to match the pitch. So it's, uh, yeah, lots of tricky things there. So can you, can you give us, can you play a couple examples maybe of how you over, overcome that, both technique and maybe some imagery that might help um, just to navigate this? Yeah, I feel like, um, and, and this is something that can be maybe suggested by the conductor when you're working on an excerpt like that would be to just maybe remind the strings to not try to match the voice in terms of vibrato, hmm. or just to play confidently. Um, oh, of course, you do your best to to adjust intonation, and this is something that you know would be addressed in rehearsal, I would imagine. Um, but when it comes to to the performance, just to 
you know, to remind the violinist to to just play confidently uh, and not try to adjust every pitch, but rather go for the gestures and focus on the line because it's going to come through. Uh, and then even if there's slight intonation things with the voice, um, it it shouldn't affect the, the quality of the, the solo. Um, and then another thing that, um, you know, you can see is that, um, you know, when we choose fingerings for, for an excerpt, um, we always try to find the fingering that would um, help the color of the excerpt or give, you know, a nice flow. And um, in the case of that excerpt, the, to have a nice color that is consistent, um, we would want to play everything on the E string, which brings a lot of shifts and uh, risky <laughs> transitions, right? So I'm saying on the E string, So I'm almost shifting in between every note, right? And then if I wanted to be super safe, then I would just start higher on the A string and then, which sounds much more secure for intonation, but then you don't get the same, um, the same connection and the same color that you have. Uh, if you stay on one string. So there are all these things to consider. And of course, if, um, you know, if it's uh, maybe less advanced choir that would be doing a work like that, then it might be a good um, good option to go for super secure fingering that may not have the same, the same changes in color, but that might just help the choir um, like stabilize the pitch. But if, if the choir is, uh, you know, if it's a professional group that is very confident with with intonation, then then I think then the violinist can be a little bit more free and follow fingerings uh, that would actually serve the the music better. Maybe. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about your bow and what what are you thinking in terms of again creating this this atmospheric this kind of heavenly sound? What are, what what is your bow doing? What do you suggest um, your bow would do? <laughs> yeah. Well, so in general, uh, when I see you know, that the composer wrote bowings. Like for, for us string players, these long slurs are usually bowings. They're not um, phrasing markings, although in contemporary music, some composers will use the, what we would consider bowings as, as phrase indications. Um, so in this case, I would do my best to follow what's there. And if I feel like, um, and then these are things that usually would be adjusted uh, once we're in the hall, or if it's a gigantic choir, then I I might decide to break the bow, right? So, I like to just just divide differently, uh, or if um, you know if there's like a, a pit that doesn't give the the musicians a lot of resonance. So the the bowings usually for solo would be adjusted once uh, once we are in the hall. And then I would even go as far as saying that um, the consordino marking could also be negotiated if if uh, if the violinist is not uh, being heard well enough. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that. And I know I've done it both ways and, <clears throat> and erring on the side of usually without mute because our, our, our halls typically need places where the sound can carry. Um, For sure. And then in this case, uh, you did ask me about the Boeing and, I, and I'm and i not answering your question. Uh, so if I was playing this without a mute, for example, I would try to go closer to the fingerboard to get a sound that is a little bit less focused because usually once you put the mute on, um, it really, well, because it squeezes the bridge, then it we lose a, a lot of the natural resonance of the string, which makes it sound uh, more covered. I forgot I was muted. It's great. So some um, possibilities um, to learn a little bit more about uh, the violin in the idiosyncrasies that comes into this amazing piece. We're talking a little bit about um, the uh, what it's like to sing it. So we're going to check in with Sarah again, um, and she has some thoughts on um, as we're navigating this beautiful vocal line. 
during all of that? So definitely, as I said earlier in the intro, those those phrases are really important. You know, like the apex of the phrase is just like, it's where your breath needs to go. I'm just constantly thinking about what, I mean, exactly what we were talking about earlier, Ben, about what is it going to take for me to gradually go down that phrase without completely plopping down. Um, it takes a lot of... Um, uh, I don't want to use the word control, but a lot of, uh, uh, oh, like finesse and a lot of um, just awareness. And um, I think that one of the cool things about this piece is it starts, it starts pretty quiet. And we make these tiny, tiny little like hills as we go along. It crescendos as we go along. The piece grows all the way to that amazing Hosanna, which is like, really one of the coolest parts about it is the coolest part about this piece my favorite requiem is the duraflay requiem and this makes me this part is just like is the duraflay requiem i mean i know that he but anyway i this for me is just like oh i'm singing the duraflay and so I, it's my favorite part um so it's really we're really growing to that part and so we've got these little hills that we have to get over to get to that part and so it's just a little more each time and i think what's really fun about this piece is that as a section um I don't know. I just feel like there's, if there's all females in this section, I feel like there's like a sisterhood with me. I'm like, you know, I am like, hey girls, let's sing this because it's like a duet with the dudes and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then she's going to talk a little bit about navigating text and line at the same time. Right. One of the dangers of this is that we we have text though that can sometimes get in the way of that. And what I loved about your performance you just did is it was it was just enough of voice consonants and unvoiced consonants to keep it seamless and even. So talk about um, you know we have we have to do both at the same time. How are you navigating line and consonants? Sure. I think, you know, really knowing, knowing the text is very important and understanding which consonants you really need to bring out, which versus which ones you don't need to bring out. Like the, the word deus, you, you should probably put that like a really good d on that D. And so I think that deus, dominos deus, those are so important. Um, but we really don't need to worry about, unless you want to get really picky, you could do sanctus, sanctus. I know some people do that. Um, I like alighting them. Sanctus, sanctus. It's just a personal preference of mine. Um, and I think that really just understanding that the very first letter of the word is the most important letter of the word. And then, you know, the rest of the, the letters, they'll come out, they'll come off, you know. It, and, and one of the great parts about like Dominus, for instance, that M, you can really sing that M. Um, uh, so, 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 so. Oh, nope. Just sing through the mmm. I mean, we practice on mmm all the time, right? So that shouldn't be very difficult. Um, same thing with plenty, 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 so chilly at the 
Um, just it really like like uh, Italian Latin really rolls off the tongue, uh, so that makes it a lot easier to sing. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the dangers that sometimes we get in with this long, luscious, horizontal music is that we forget that those are energizing moments that help us uh, to really um, uh, hear this phrase and hear these ideas that Foray wanted. There's a reason he put text where he did, as he certainly knew what he was doing. And, and you you um, were talking about, you know, that he writes so well for the voice, and that's certainly the case with all his art songs. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. Great. Okay, we talked a lot about the beginning and then this um, moment um, where the horns come in is, is one of the greatest moments of all uh, Western music. Um, so I write several things that you can um, uh, consider there um, about resonance and, and doubling of voices. Um, so enjoy that moment and as quickly as the gates of heaven swing open, they swing back shut. Getting into our next movement, the Pia Yesu. Just a few thoughts um, about that. Um, again, we have this, um, what a way to start with just um, a, a B flat organ chord. Um, having done this piece now many times with, uh, in the context of the Requiem and, and separately, um, the danger of this piece uh, for a developing voice is it sits right around E flat and F. And that's a, that's a dangerous place to navigate um, for a developing voice. Um, and so just be aware of that. The, the notes are simple, um, but it's slow. And so there's some things to um, consider there. Um, often the first performance uh, was done with a... Uh, boy soprano, but, but that is something that is also uh, can be uh, very challenging of, of confidence um, and nerves. And so uh, also I've seen this done as with a youth choir or a children's choir um, that um, has done this. There's a little bit of a technical issue um, at letter A. Veronique was talking about consordino or where the, the uh, strings need to put mutes on that does change the sound quality. And so sometimes intonation can be an issue. And so places like uh, letter A, I like to encourage the cello two and the contrabass to play out just a little bit. Um, and then the bottom octaves um, to play out just a little bit. So we have a really great foundation uh, to tune to. So there's so much nuance um, in this piece. Um, again, we don't need to conduct a lot. We can really just let and power the musicians here. However, um, if your organ is very far away, um, you will need to be more active uh, to be able to coordinate all of the forces together. Moving on to the Agnus Dei movement, we have this theme um, that if you have not heard it or you haven't heard it in a while, it's one that will stick with you. Um, again, I'm thinking to give two, three preps to really give confidence uh, to the strings. Um, and so Sasha um, on cello is gonna play this main theme. Now the uh, cellos don't have the main theme at the very beginning. So she's gonna play um, at the end of this movement, to letter F to the end, just so we get a sense of this main theme and the idiosyncrasies of it. Let's, let's watch Sasha play here. Great. So that's wonderful. So again, for uh, players that are less experienced, what makes this difficult and what are maybe some options and some thoughts you would, would maybe encourage them or to think about in this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's awkward, man. Um, practice it. <laughs> that's not really help, helpful. Again, I would make sure since you have a lot of upper positions and like middle positions, I'd make sure that you're really balanced in your hand. If you're tilting your hand one way or the other, it's just a recipe for bad intonation. Um, but I also think about, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, especially since this is a piece with singers, I'm thinking about how this is going to sound and feel if I was singing it. 
I want there to be kind of like air, a little bit of air in my in my sound, and I want to connect with my bow and my nose at the same time, if that makes sense. So I want this to really have a flow like you were going to sing it. And I think that helps it to, to have a little bit more vibrancy and a little bit more life. And then you're less obsessing about, oh, my God, i got to shift some hair out of there, and I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. So I think anything that you can do to, to be thinking – you know, phrasing as opposed to, this is difficult, I'm going to mess this up, or this is po a pike might possibly mess it up, because well, you might, but whatever. Yeah. Love it. Okay, um, and then, so that main theme starting um, with uh, the violas, and then we get into this uh, beautiful tenor line, so we're, we're creating so much nuance um, there. Um, remember, Frey writes, that we've talked about sometimes, so well for the voice, um, so really letting that have a natural um, flow to it uh, is, is that one really sings um, so well there. Um, Sasha's also going to talk to us a little bit um, about when we get into uh, letter A is the affect changes here. Let's watch her. <laughs> Is lovely. When we get, can we really um, uh, separate uh, the um, the eighth note at A? Ba, ba. So we we really land on that. Um, the other thing, can we have more space than before the sixteenth? Ba be ba ba da da. You know that kind of thing. We try it, uh, like that. Be helpful, and I probably if I was playing this, I might slur um, those first four notes of seventeen. So it might make it a little bit more legato and then be more contrasting with the next I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See how, how it goes. Great. The choir comes in at A. Um, I like to suggest we don't use too much galatal there, like we're lighting a match. So it's anus, really, that pleading quality. Um, we go through this uh, section. Um, we return to the tenor theme again um, in 32. And then we have this amazing moment at letter C. Um, again, one of my favorite moments, but this unison C. Um, that we're coming from. And then we land in, in A flat, a, 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 a tonality very far from the beginning D um, that we started with. Such a special, special moment here. And so balancing all of these harmonies, the text nuance um, is, is so important. So I write several things um, there. We would increase intensity through letter D. Um, again, like we had uh, previously, is after we get to 65 and 66, we really need to keep that uh, fortissimo all the way. So no hint of uh, diminuendo. Um, so we lead right into uh, the horn entrances um, and the strings, a, a, a climactic moment here before we return to letter E. Now, this is like the beginning. However, you will notice that there's um, an adagio uh, marking, um, not largo like before. So we need to consider what Frey was intending there. And then we end the way it started. Okay, in the interest of time, we have to keep going. I wish we could we could spend hours and hours um, on, on this piece. So I, I, I left a lot for you to read um, on your own. The Liberame. The baritone solo uh, returns again. We have these um, these figures uh, that uh, I guess again are just orchestral, but for me they're gonna they're gonna play them lovely and in tune. Um, but for me, if I can create some kind of affect, what is going on in this scene? As I would thinking about uh, a stage director and directing the elements of the drama. So it's not just but. 
uh, they're just not quarter notes. There's something more to it. So I, I think of uh, a processional to Jerusalem, it conjures up ideas of the uh, hymns, uh, Psalms of Ascent, um, or a heartbeat. So we need to have some internal reason for uh, why these quarter notes are like that um, as we go. So again, I love speaking in metaphors in this imagery. Um, it helps us for us to inter really internalize the music, but there's times where we can share that imagery uh, with the choir and the orchestra. I say some things about the organ, which is important there. Um, again, uh, oftentimes you hear we can uh, performances of this where you can barely hear the organ, uh, but it really adds its own uniqueness and sound uh, to that. As we're going through uh, measure 25, um, this is one thing that I personally like to do is treating this similar to like a, a cantus firmus, uh, but we're going to give a lot to the violas here that um, the baritone is, 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 is high in his range, um, so that will be no problem um, usually covering um, him up, but to give accent um, and direction uh, to these uh, moving notes. Letter B, we have, we're talking about trembling um, and, with, and with fear. Uh, I like to break these. A lot of times you hear tremens, tremens. Personally, I think it gives uh, more drama. Tremens, tremens. So the second one is a little bit more. We go through this section and building and building into letter C, where we again have this horn call. I think it's interesting that um, the horn entrance uh, and letter C, that can be conceived in kind of a big three, two, um, and then the orchestra and choir in a big six, four. And so you, again, you have dual ideas uh, going on. Um, this is such, this is, this is really uh, such a dramatic moment um, and we, we can make so much nuance on it. I really like to give the orchestra some time to, uh, to really find their affect and their drama in there. And so there's a lot of things we can do with them. Just a quick example, uh, measure 58. I like ba ba be ba bum 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 ba ba be ba ba. So there's just a little bit of nuance that goes into their figures. Letter, D, right before letter D, if you're just using two horns, um, the horns three and four play there, but the first horn, first and second horn are, are sitting around. And so for me, I like to add a little bit of color there, sketch in that part, um, and they play before D. Um, we have this wonderful string figure um, in letter D as well on the upper strings, upper violas. Um, and again, I don't want this to just sound like background music. And so for me, this is still fiery text. So I'm gonna ask them to so there's in, some intensity there, um, but it can be soft and they're really um, uh, compact bows and a, a bright and finite sound. We go through, we turn to the Requiem setting, the, the music becomes very um, reflective after this affective music. And then letter E is um, back to the beginning. Letter F, I wanna throw out one other consideration for you. Um, again, Foray, uh, just marks piano dolce. Uh, and so we might consider this the middle ground where it's not coming or going, it's just still. And we save um, some of the emotional drama in our text and in our um, crescendoing uh, for later as this uh, develops. Um, and then the baritone solo returns and it fades away. I, I prefer not to do too much retard um, at the end. So we... Um, it just kind of gets softer and softer and softer, um, and we, we fade away as we, as we, the picture of the saints achieving Jerusalem may be conceived. Okay, we get to the final movement, um, the in paradisum. Um, so many wonderful things going on here, similar to the sanctus, these ideas of stillness and light and, and conjuring heaven. Um, uh, the organ part is so important here. If we can ask for a, a, a flu or a flute stop uh, that has chiffiness to it, um, lots full of color, that sets up so much. 
um, for what we do. I often like to use a broad horizontal plane um, in this heavenly music. Uh, so that's a suggestion there. So Sarah is going to talk a little bit about navigating the vocal line here. Let's check in with her. In Paradisum movement, um, and of course, um, Sarah, we were just talking about how, um, especially as a pro singer, you, you've sung this piece probably countless times in various different ways. So there's there's maybe three possibilities that come to mind um, that um, you've been asked to do in the past. Can you maybe demonstrate just the first phrase of sure. those three different possibilities and, and, and maybe tell us what, what um, style you're doing before you sing it? Sure. So I'll start off with more of a, a full voice sound, um, something that I think you'll you might most encounter when you're singing with um, you could be singing with professionals. You'll also more encounter this with um, amateurs and with college students probably. So. In Option. It's a beautiful option, and when you have multiple, you know, uh, soprano voices singing that as one, it can sound like a really beautiful, shimmery, like, um, you know, like a 1940s chorus, and I think that's so lovely sometimes. Um, another option is to do it completely uh, without vibrato, and it's uh, also a very common option because it's used in churches a lot, um, and you'll hear probably more professional choirs singing this way, uh, church choirs singing this way, um, and children's choirs probably as well. In um, <laughs> And it's a beautiful option too. I think that um, uh, for grown female voices, it's not always the popular option, which is why I think the next option is one of my favorites, which is just adding a little bit of both. It's just a nice, it's a healthy, um, not as colorful sound, but it still adds some shimmer. So a little bit of a vibrato in it. So here we go. In The, the shimmer one too. You can say, hey, this vibrato is great, but on your very last note, can you please have no vibrato? You know, you can you can ask for things like that if you really want a true taper to a kind of a niente type of feeling. That's great. And and I love that you brought up that the uh middle version. And that's that's typically um what we do uh inspire. I like to think of it uh, as uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You have um, the different porridge and you just find just the right um, one. So I want to dive into that just a little bit more. Technically, what are you thinking there? Um, because this is often something that we don't teach um, necessarily in our, in our conservatories and stuff. And so how have you come to learn this kind of hybrid singing that, that most people do in a professional setting? I think a lot, it takes a lot of concentration and does take a lot of experience too. Not saying that you can't do it for thousands of years. You really can learn it. Um, it I think a, a, a good way of thinking of it, you can take it, think of it one of two ways. The first way is to think of it, you normally sing in, a, if you normally sing with full vibrato in, um, in a choir, you might want to consider just lightening it up a little. Like I think, like thinking of a lighter approach rather than a, a that's, that's a bad, bad way to think about it. Um, I think, when we're when we're thinking about spin, we're thinking about a constant. We're thinking about constant drive of your air. That air and your your the oscillation of your vocal folds is being caused by a specific amount of air that's coming up through your cords. Um, at the same time, the way that, for me anyway, the way that I can achieve a lesser vibrato is to not put as much air up through my vocal folds and to not create that that oscillation. And so um, this is kind of the happy medium between going completely straight tone and going um, with full vibrato. Um, it is a way that if you kind of think about like 
sometimes I think about pop singing. I mean, you know, if you're like singing, I'm really bad at pop music, but if you were to sing this as a pop song, you could be like, in paradiso. If you're like, like singing in the shower, it's kind of one of those, you sing straight and then you add that little vibrato in. Um, this is kind of how it is, but except you're keeping the space in your um, in the back of your throat or with your with your soft palate up. You're keeping that space there. You're keeping your air still flowing. Um, you're not cutting things off and making your vowels really short um, or shallow. Uh, but yeah, I think that it's a it's a good it's a good mix, and you can play around with it too. And there's no wrong answer with it either. And I think that's one of the coolest things about it is that any voice type can do it. So you've got um, if you if you're a person who naturally oscillates and has a really difficult time singing just straight, um, this is you can still do this. Um, it's still an option. And if you're a person who sings straight mostly um, and you have a hard time oscillating, this is totally an option too. You it's it's a good happy medium for everybody. That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, as we go through this line, again, this takes a lot of finesse and a lot of practice. Um, we've often sometimes seen this with small soprano sections or children's or youth choir. Um, I give some metaphors there. Um, measure 21, I'm sorry, actually, we're going to back up just a little bit. Uh, just a, a quick thing that I really like to highlight. We've we've talked about this um, this mixolydian mode in the Tedecet theme starting on an F, and then we, the arrival is an E-flat, that flat uh, seventh, um, that is the, uh, that comes back again, um, a, a tie-in, a connection point, um, into measure, uh, 16. And so I'd like to, um, encourage the viola two to make more of the uh, C natural and along, um, with the organ box. Um, this, we have this kind of tonal ambiguity that goes throughout this. We don't have a really a firm setting of uh, D major yet. Uh, we're avoiding uh, leading tones here. Um, and then we, we have the text Jerusalem. That's so special. Um, coming into the, uh, in the rudder version, uh, measure 25, the solo viola. Um, and then our big arrival, one of the most special moments, um, is measure 29. Again, we have the harp, um, we have the solo violin, and the, the solo viola that just played um, a few bars before. They're playing in unison, um, and that's very rare um, in that higher register. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, compositional devices that um, Ferre use. We're going to skip. Um, Verani talks a little bit about um, intonation um, on the violin and just generally her main points um, that uh, we're just going to skip for now in the interest of time is that um, as we're shifting, we're thinking of the arrival. So string players have lots of shifts that we've heard both Veronique and Sasha uh, talking about it. But one thing that we can encourage them to do is to make those shifts as seamless as possible. And we can help them give ideas of arrival points um, so they can, they can translate that um, to how they need to move their bow um, in their hand. So we're going to check in for our last video. Uh, Sarah is going to sing um, at letter B, um, and this is where we have more text there. So let's listen to Sarah just a little bit um, in this second half of this piece. All right. <laughs> Oh, that's just, that's an amazing moment it. of all Western music. Uh, any thoughts there that that you're again thinking about in this last little section? So this is these are like I, I, the the thing that throws that stands out to me most about this section is that this is the most wordy I feel like we get. We this is a, at least the sopranos anyway in this piece, um, and so. Uh, I I'm loving that we're finally getting a lot of words, and there's um, a little more than just like 
quarters and half notes for us. Um, so I really want to play around with the text on this. I really want to under, you know, really get those Latin, you know, consonants and vowels going on. Um, and I think those, that really makes this section unique and stand out, particularly for us. Um, and I don't think, I don't think it's so stands out so much that the audience would would realize. But for me as an artist, it makes a difference. And so I like that. Um, also, you're right that going up to the F natural at C <laughs> is like just the one of the best parts in this entire piece. Um, and I, I just love that. I would say, um, again, it takes a lot of um, uh, stability and a lot of um, finesse figuring out how to bring that uh, bring the phrase back down from that F natural. Um, we're building up, building up. I think, you know, depending on your section, depending on you individually, if you're doing stagger breathing or depending on um, the the choir, you know, I, I see that Rudder has given us those, those courtesy breath marks. And those are great. I don't really like the idea of breathing in that entire phrase. And I would love to make that whole phrase by myself, but I know that I've got to depend on my colleagues in order to make that sound like it's um, seamless. And so I think this is one of the, the exceptions that Foray doesn't really give us a chance to breathe on this part, but who cares? Um, there, we've got buddies to help us out. Uh, so I think that if, 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 that, if at all possible, I like going, <laughs> And you can with between you don't have to necessarily breathe when you lift. You can lift and not breathe. Yeah, and 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 that gives that gives the random soprano who is like I can sneak a breath in there anyway the chance to do it if they want to. Like then they can go which is fine, or somebody uh, the chance to drop a note or something like that. But I um, I think that that doesn't really need a breath at all. <laughs> That's great. The in paradisum setting is is was not typically a part of the requiem mass, uh, more done for the burial setting, and so foray was really the first polyphonic setting um, of this. Um, so he begins and ends the same way um, in such beauty, and so this was kind of a, a drive uh, by quick um, ideas uh, for you to think about and. Um, in making this piece so special. There is a danger of a piece that is really popular and performed a lot that we, we, we just get into those first layers of the onion. But I'd like to encourage all of us, we just the more we peel away, the more we find of Foray's um, intention and desire. And we try to share that with our musicians and um, our audiences. And so um, I hope that you will take the time to read some of these thoughts um, and they are helpful to you. We have just a moment. We like to end these lectures um, with um, any burning questions um, that you had. So if there's something that you came today that you, you wanted to visit about and ask, we will certainly try to do that for just a, a, a moment as we wrap up this evening. You can unmute or put those um, in the chat. Great. It looks like that we've covered a lot um, in 90 minutes. The one quick thing I would suggest is um, be careful of what you program the foray with. Um, there has been this popular idea to program it with other requiems, specifically the Duraflay. Um, and for me, that's a lot of the same color palette. Um, and so as you're thinking about programming this 30, 35 minute piece, um, to, to think about uh, text tie-in or color tie-ins, um, but we, we want to give our audiences and our musicians a wide palette, just like you would serve a great um, meal at a four or five-star restaurant. We want variances. And so, uh, at least in my opinion, um, doing two requiem things like that 
um, is, uh, is a lot of the same thing. Great. Well, thank you for spending uh, a part of your Tuesday evening with us. This lecture is also recorded and will be on uh, Spire's YouTube page shortly. So best to you. Thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye.